Professor Stuart Hamroff received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh and his MD degree from the Heinemann University Hospital. He's had a very distinguished career at the University of Arizona since 1975, becoming professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Psychology and associate director for the Center for Consciousness Studies. Thank you for organizing and inviting uh, us back. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. So this is a very diverse uh, conference with a lot of different aspects of consciousness and a diverse audience, so I'm going to try to address those. Um, so in the, uh, in the talk, uh, Bing, you see here, is meant to imply consciousness, awareness, subjective experience, phenomenal uh, first-person point of view, consciousness. We all know what it is, it's just hard to explain or to define or to, or to come to a scientific explanation for. But for the purpose of the talk, Bing meets conscious awareness. And the, the, the question is, how does Bing occur? Why does it occur? So the first question is, what is consciousness? So I'm going to give a sort of definition, mostly from a Western perspective, but I, but I hope to bring together Eastern and Western approaches. Consciousness implies awareness, subjective phenomenal experience of internal and external worlds. Consciousness may also imply a sense of self, feelings, choice, control of voluntary behavior, memory, thought, language, and when we close our eyes or meditate, internally generated images and geometric patterns. Our views of reality, of the universe, of ourselves depend on consciousness. Consciousness defines our existence. But what consciousness actually is remains scientifically unknown. In Eastern philosophy, consciousness pervades a deeper level of reality. Being consciousness is everywhere. We are part of it, sort of like a wave in an ocean. What is the origin of consciousness? I think there are three possibilities. Number one, consciousness emerged during biological evolution from complex computation. This is the view taken by most Western scientists reductionists, materialists, most Western philosophers, uh, most neuroscientists, psychologists, cognitive scientists. The second possibility, uh, which is an Eastern point of view, is that consciousness has always been in the universe as the ground of being, or God, in spiritual terms. Consciousness is everything. The third possibility is that consciousness, or its precursor at least, has always been in the universe with cognitive consciousness with which we are familiar, uh, emerging during biological evolution. And this is more or less the approach taking, taken in the uh, orca war theory that I developed with Sir Roger that I'll be talking about. So along those lines, when did consciousness arise? So here we have the universe, if you will, with the Big Bang. And uh, the Earth, here's the, the time scale here, about 14 and a half billion years ago. The Earth began about four and a half billion years ago. Life, simple life, eukaryotic animals, the Cambrian explosion with uh, tremendous growth, uh, development of, of, all, of animal species, and very recently on this big scale, language and tools. So at what point in this time scale did consciousness appear on the scene? Well, that depends. Most reductionists, uh, Western scientists, would say fairly recently in, in humans or primates, perhaps, or, or simpler animals, but fairly recently, being it would be here. Others would say all animal life, all animals have consciousness, eukaryotes, for example. Others would say that even simple organisms have consciousness, maybe even all matter, uh, uh, panpsychists. And some would say that consciousness preceded even the Big Bang, maybe even caused the Big Bang. That, again, is more of an Eastern uh, approach. Now, if we look at evolution, I'm not sure if you can see this slide very well, but um, the Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. And if you look at the growth of, of life, we have blue-green algae and, and nucleated cells. And uh, here is the first uh, eukaryotic cell, which uh, may have been a symbiotic event from uh, uh, fl flagellated uh, spirochetes invading prokaryotes. That's the theory of Margulis Sagan. It's a little bit controversial, but this is one possibility. And this brought the cytoskeleton into prokaryotes and gave simple cells the ability to, to move around, to compartmentalize, become more efficient, and I think process information. And 
then uh, evolution proceeded rather gradually, very, very small incremental steps, until uh, about uh, five and a half, 500 million years ago, five, 550 million years ago, the Cambrian evolutionary explosion, when all the uh, animal phyla developed fairly rapidly. And uh, we know from uh, um, fossils that these types of organisms were present at that time. Simple worms and strange creatures and, and urchins. Uh, and this, is, uh, this particular uh, organism, this, this urchin, is, uh, is present today. It's called actinospherium. And it's spherical with these axonemes sticking out. And at least the ones present today, if we cut across them, see in cross-section, these axonemes are made up of these double spiral arrays of microtubules, which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. So this is in cross-section, and these are hollow tubes that go the length of the axoneme. And uh, one of the things that got me interested in anesthesia early on in my career was that anesthetics caused these structures to depolymerize. If you put actinospherium in an anesthetic environment, the axonemes collapse, they, they, they depolymerize. And that was thought to be a mechanism of anesthesia, although it turns out that it requires quite a bit more anesthesia to depolymerize microtubules than it does to put someone to sleep. Nonetheless, it established a relationship. <clears throat> These same microtubules are found in nerve cells in our brains. So here's a, here's a neuron. This is the axon where the microtubules are continuous and unipolar. And here are the dendrites where the microtubules are interrupted and of mixed polarity in these local networks, which is where I think the consciousness occurs in dendrites, in these uh, unique networks of, of mixed uh, polarity microtubules. And they're the same size as axons, uh, the microtubules, as the microtubules and axons. So we'll come back to microtubules in neurons a little bit. I think one thing that's true that everyone would agree, uh, whether you're coming from an Eastern perspective or a Western perspective, is that consciousness is all that truly matters. From an Eastern perspective, that it's obvious. From a Western perspective, if you're brain dead or you're comatose, uh, there's really no, no point in living. And um, uh, this is a big problem in medicine to determine if people actually have consciousness when they're in a vegetative state or a comatose state. The question that everybody wonders about uh, is whether consciousness can exist outside the body after death in uh, reincarnation, for example. Is it possible that uh, consciousness exists uh, outside the body? We know many, many examples of near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, anecdotal reports of, of, of uh, afterlife uh, and so forth. We don't really know the answer to that. Western materialists would say, no, it's impossible. But, that's, but they can't explain consciousness in the, in the brain, so I don't see how they could ex exclude it from being outside the brain. Another question is, can consciousness be downloaded into a computer? There's a lot of talk now about, uh, about uh, downloading consciousness uh, into a computer for, um, through, by decoding the brain, by figuring out, by mapping the brain, and uh, something like this. And therefore, if, if you're wealthy enough and, and your, your body's about to die, you can download your consciousness into a computer. The big uh, champion of this idea is, uh, one of them is Ray uh, Kurzweil, whose idea is called the singularity. The idea there is that when our computers get uh, equivalent to the brain in terms of uh, computational complexity, the consciousness will be, able, uh, will be able to be downloaded into a computer, that consciousness can exist in a computer. I don't think so, but we'll come back to that. Now, one example of this is the film The Matrix, where consciousness existed in a virtual reality, um, Bing, perhaps, and also the film uh, The Avatar, where consciousness was downloaded into this avatar who existed in this uh, a dif uh, different world. The answers to these questions, whether consciousness can exist outside the body, after life, and or whether it can be downloaded into a computer depend on what consciousness actually is. So the question then becomes, how does the brain produce consciousness? We know it's, the brain has consciousness. How does, it, how, does it, uh, how does it do that? That's a good question. It's something that I've been spending my career working on, and many of the people in this room have, and many people around the world have. We take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world out there appears in our head. 
something like that. Um, how that happens is studied by neuroscientists who probe the brain, by roboticists, computer scientists, by artists who try to capture the essence of awareness, physicists studying reality, psychiatrists looking uh, in, into the deeper levels of the brain, uh, anesthesiologists, and that looks suspiciously like me, um, uh, meditators and Eastern spiritualists, and Western philosophers. So in Western philosophy, the brain is thought to produce consciousness by complex computation among neurons. So the light enters Plato's head, if this is Plato, bing, and he has the world in his head. The world out there is, is all in our head, according to Western philosophy. But this, this causes some problems. As Plato noted, for example, a, this representation may poorly represent reality. For example, in Plato's cave, where his impression was that only two-dimensional shadows existed. There were only two dimensions in reality, and that was, and that was enough. That's, that's all he knew, or, or they knew. Perhaps there's a deeper reality, more exciting, more interesting, deeper. And a lot of people today think that that's the case. Descartes picked up on, on this uh, idea and noticed that it was true that we could each be a mere brain in a vat, fed information by an evil genius. So here's a brain in a vat. Evil uh, computer, in this case, is feeding information. And he's thinking, bing, I'm walking outside in the sun. We don't, and this is the, the Matrix and other films have picked up on, on this idea. So both, according to Western philosophy, both consciousness and reality may be illusion. So modern Western science sees the brain uh, as a computer in which nerve cells, neurons, shown here, and synapses act like bits and switches in a computer. So this is the basic metaphor analogy between the brain and computers. And the idea that each neuron firing on each, each neuron is one bit, one single bit of information. And I think there's uh, big problems with that, but that is the, the, the paradigm. We'll come back to that. Descartes made other contributions. He said that uh, the contents of consciousness are like the play, a play on a stage. So we have inputs, scripts, story, props, actors, lighting, and so forth, onto a stage, which is then presented to the audience. So the problem is, who's the audience? For Descartes, it was the, the soul floating above the body. He was a dualist. Now, in the 70s, computer scientists uh, Simon and Newell and many others developed similar computer architectures based on this, where you had various inputs into a global workspace or a CPU that then presented outputs which went to a monitor so you could look at it on a computer screen. In the 80s, neuroscientists, including Bernie Bars, Edelman Tononi, Sean Joe, Dehane, Crick and Colk, and others, cast thalamocortical oscillations as this, uh, um, this Cartesian theater, if you will, with sensory inputs, memory, and so forth, executive uh, coming down from executive cortex into this thalamocortical system, which then somehow produced consciousness, bing, based on sensory stimuli and arousal, bottom up and top down. And that was the dominant paradigm for a number of years. Thalamocortical projections mediate arousal and sensory-based consciousness. So this is the thalamocortical system, and you can see coming up from below, it spreads out to all different parts of the cortex. But what about mental states without sensory inputs and arousals? What about if you close your eyes and daydream? Perhaps some of you are doing that right now. And thinking about something else. Task, these are task-free, stimulus-independent thought, internally generated states, mind-wandering, episodic memory, meditation, daydreaming. They may not depend on sensory inputs. How does that work? Marcus Rakel uh, uh, described these types of uh, processes as default modes, or the brain's dark energy, and uh, showed that uh, they included a number of, of things like episodic memory, introspection, self-referential thought, daydreaming, etc., uh, creativity, meditation, uh, that occurred without sensory inputs. They could be cued or triggered by sensory inputs, but they can occur without them. And he showed in this uh, excellent paper in 2005 in PNAS that, um, that the, if you look at this, these areas here, that over time they flip from being very active to very inactive, and other areas do the, do the opposite. So it seems that this, either the sensory-based inputs system or the default mode uh, system are active at any one time, and that the brain switches back and forth 
between these two states. So there's attention-based sensory processing, uh, the thalamocortical system, and there's my, the default mode net, networks, mind-wandering, episodic memory, internal regenerated states, and consciousness seems to go back and forth between these two states roughly every 10 seconds. Now, they can vary highly, but uh, if you look at it over uh, a longer time scale, it's about every, every 10 seconds. And these were the anti-correlated networks of Rakel. Now, the sensory-driven and default mode networks um, uh, don't really tell us about consciousness, however, because both of them, or either of them, can either be non-conscious, um, what David Chalmers calls the easy problems, zombie modes, the autopilot, for example, all these sensory perception, controlled behavior, learning, memory, attention, language, etc., can be at sometimes conscious uh, or non-conscious as here, and other times conscious, shown in pink. So over time, what happens is that things move back and forth, and we go uh, different processes becoming conscious and non-conscious. Consciousness moves around the brain as a kind of self-organizing process. It's not that there's one area of the brain that's directing, okay, now you're conscious, now you're conscious. It's more of an envelope or a, a self-organizing uh, process moving around. That's what we need to figure out. What distinguishes conscious from non-conscious brain processes? We go back to the basic metaphor in Western science that uh, neurons and synapses are like nodes and switches in a computer. And we find what's called the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. This is the basic concept of a neuron uh, that stems from the 50s and Huxley, where you have a cell body and many dendrites that receive information and integrate that information to a threshold at the axon hillock or axon initiation zone and triggers an all or none spike. So this is kind of like analog and this is digital. And the signals in, in the Western paradigm are by ion channels at the membrane. So this is considered to all be membrane-based processing. I think that's a mistake. But the idea is the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, neuron integrates inputs and triggers the outputs to the next layer of neurons. Integrate and fire, integrate and fire. That's the basic idea in Western neuroscience. So here's uh, a biological neuron with the dendrites and cell body integrating, triggering at the ax axon initiation segment, firing to the next. This is a uh, computer model that was taken by um, uh, a number of people in computer science to make computer systems, auto, uh, uh, neural networks, based on integrated, integrated fire neural networks, which integrate and then fire. And this is kind of a cartoon version uh, of both of them. So if we have a network of these uh, neurons where uh, firing is, uh, I've got the dendrites and the axon together here, although that's not ne necessarily true, inputs coming in over here from the left, and outputs over there in the top and bottom. And depending on the inputs, you can see a zero, one to make it simple, that over time we get various outputs uh, dependent on inputs. So input, given set of inputs will give a, a given set of outputs. And that's pretty much the paradigm in modern science. But where's consciousness? Now, people in this view would say, well, consciousness emerges at a high level of complexity of this type of computation. But nobody's ever specified a threshold or said why that should happen or how it happens or how many neurons or how many firings or how complex and so forth. So uh, it's, it doesn't really explain it. Where's the bing is another way of putting it. And also, where's the synchrony? One thing we do know is that, um, so let me just back up and say the brain as a neuronal computer cannot account for consciousness, I would argue, uh, at least it hasn't as yet and cannot account for gamma synchrony, which correlates with consciousness. Now, as you, as you probably know, the best neural correlate of consciousness, the NCC, is gamma synchrony EEG. So if you put electrodes on someone's brain, you get all these squiggly lines, and then you do a, a Fourier analysis, and, and you break it into, uh, or, or you break it down into different frequency bins, uh, the so-called EEG uh, bands, and gamma, which is 30 to 90 hertz, uh, is the one that seems to correlate best with consciousness. And coherence in gamma synchrony ac across brain regions uh, is the best uh, correlate of consciousness. But, um, for example, on a visual cue, uh, a few uh, hundred milliseconds afterwards, there's a burst of gamma synchrony with other cortical uh, regions, and this is what correlates with consciousness. So this part of the brain and these other parts of the brain are synchronized in the, in the range of 30 to 90 hertz, and that's gamma synchrony. And that's the best measurable correlate of consciousness that we have. 
In this study that was done uh, from Davidson's lab at Wisconsin, uh, with Lutz as the lead art, art author in uh, PNAS about probably eight or ten years ago, uh, they studied gamma. They looked for gamma synchrony in uh, meditating monks who were selected by the Dalai Lama for their long history and proficiency in meditating. And uh, the control group was college students who were taught to meditate over a couple of days. Now, the college students had gamma synchrony, but the monks had gamma synchrony that was higher in terms of uh, frequency. It was actually uh, roughly 80 hertz, whereas the average is 40 hertz, and also higher intensity. So higher intensity, higher, more highly coherent, and higher frequency in the trained meditative monks. And I would argue that they are more conscious than these guys. Now, how do you explain gamma synchrony? This is somewhat of a controversial uh, area because if you have axonal dendritic connections and chemical synapses, uh, you get delays and it's very, high, very difficult to have uh, a perfect coherence. One, one uh, factor that's involved is, is instead of uh, dendritic axonal, axonal dendritic synapses is side to side or lateral connections through what are called gap junctions, where the gap junctions can be open or closed and when they are open, this dendrite and this, these dendrites and these dendrites are synchronized and will uh, depolarize uh, synchronously, coherently. So here's uh, some schematics of a neuron uh, where we have the dendrites, the cell body, and the axon here. We can see the internal structure of the microtubules, which we'll get to in a moment. And we can see that there are two types of synapses. There's the chemical synapses that everybody talks about where a, a chemical is released and uh, goes across to the postsynaptic receptors. There's also, uh, in this case, dendritic-dendritic gap junctions, where the membranes are fused and will synchronize and will uh, depolarize synchronously. So if this one depolarizes, this one will also. And here we see a gap junction. It's actually a window or a door. It'd be as if we opened the door to that other room and we all became part of one room and we're all synchronized together. So it creates sort of a syncytium among neurons. So if you connect neurons by these lateral dendritic-dendritic gap junctions, um, you get synchrony. So, and this we know from uh, studies measuring uh, consciousness, correlating with consciousness, that this type of dendritic-dendritic gap junction-mediated synchrony correlates with consciousness, with Bing. So if we have our network of neurons and we open a gap junction here and we see coherence, and, uh, we'll, and uh, depending on which ones open and which ones uh, don't, we see this envelope of synchronized neurons that actually can move around the brain. And I would argue that consciousness exists in this type of, of uh, uh, dendritic gap junction uh, mediated neurons that literally move around the brain, can go wherever consciousness wants to go. So if you're watching me and listening to me, it's in, maybe in your occipital and auditory cortex, and then you daydream about something, it goes somewhere else. For example, um, the evidence for this is that gap junction mediated gamma synchrony in olfactory bulb cortex correlates with conscious smell. So if you smell something, uh, there is gap junction mediated gamma synchrony in your olfactory cortex. Conscious feelings of pleasure and reward correlate with gap junction mediated gamma synchrony in dopaminergic nucleus accumbens. So here's the bing here. So if you have gamma synchrony between prefrontal cortex uh, uh, nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmentum, uh, you're having pleasurable feelings. And that correlates with, uh, with uh, gap junction mediated uh, synchrony in these areas. So uh, to summarize the, these ideas, I published a paper called The Conscious Pilot, which is based on the idea that dendritic synchrony moves through the brain to mediate consciousness. And I used the metaphor of, of an airplane on autopilot and uh, we can do a lot of things on autopilot without consciousness, um, but if there's turbulence or the plane's in trouble, the pilot better get back in the, in the cockpit and take over. So consciousness can literally move around, leave the cockpit, go to the bathroom or whatever, and then come back. And I think if you're, sometimes you're driving your car, well, maybe not in India, you have to be pretty conscious in India of what's going on, but where I live, you can sort of daydream while you're driving. Uh, my colleague Mark Ebner and I published a computer model of this on laterally connected uh, uh, artificial neurons in a network and showed that we could, uh, we could detect uh, figure to ground changes. So, brain is neuronal computer cannot account for gamma synchrony which correlates with consciousness.
Also, the next topic is brain activity comes too late for real-time co control, according to this view, renders consciousness epiphenomenal illusion. That is, it, it occurs too late, it's after the fact, and we don't really have any free will or anything like free will. We're just kind of along for the ride. The, the evidence for this goes back a long ways. Brain activity according with, correlating with conscious perception apparently occurs too late, 150 to 500 milliseconds after impingement on our set, sense organs, to account for actions initiated or completed within 100 milliseconds. So let's say you're talking to somebody and, and you hear what they say and you respond to them. You think you're responding consciously, but if you look in your brain, the activity that correlates with figuring out what they said happens after you've already responded. So this includes preparation of spoken words, analysis of sensory input, choice playing a voluntary action, hitting a baseball or a cricket ball pitched at 90 miles an hour, the processing just seems to be too late, and, but yet we've already responded. So the presumption is we respond non-consciously and have a false illusion of being in conscious control. Because subjectively, we feel as though we perceive and respond to these perceptions consciously. Consequently, subjective feeling of conscious control of these behaviors is illusion. They are merely non-conscious reflexive responses. Wegener, Dennett, and so forth. This is the, the, pretty much the party line in neuroscience, that we are acting non-consciously much of the time, and consciousness is epiphenomenal, occurs too late. Accordingly, consciousness is epiphenomenal, and we are, as T.H. Huxley famously said, conscious automata, helpless spectators. And I use the Pac-Man here, who's being manipulated through this grid by somebody pushing a lever, except in this case it would be the, the, uh, your subconscious or non-conscious activity moving you around. Is there any hope for free will? I believe there is. Um, I, I'll get to that, the solution in a minute. But one example of, of why it looks bad, it looks like we can't have conscious control in real time, comes from uh, evidence from Ben Libet's readiness potential, which I think has been misinterpreted. But ba basically, the experiment was you ask someone to lift their finger, and you record when they lift their finger, uh, or, and you ask them when they decided to lift their finger, and you measure their brain activity. And what they found was that the readiness potential, that there's activity well before the person says, I decided to move it now, and even before they actually move their finger. So this was interpreted to mean that this, this activity here is initiating the finger movement, and this, this conscious intent, I decide to move my finger, uh, happens after, after the decision has been made by your non-conscious brain. We'll come back to that in a second. Another example of, of this is the color five phenomenon. So over here we have a red ball and a, and a green ball, or actually we have one ball. So the observer is looking this way. Here's the screen, and this is time. So the, the red starts on the left, goes away, and appears on the right a few milliseconds later. Uh, red, green, red, green. Now, if you look at it, you see red, red turning to green halfway across, which, which makes sense. But if you then trick the person, if you, after doing this maybe a hundred times, you then go red, 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 they're not fooled. You'd think they would be fooled because they're used to, to seeing that, but they're not. The observer seems to know what the final, final color will be. How does that happen? Now, Dan Dennett, who believes in epiphenomenalism, says that the brain alters and fills in content. Real-time perception is overwritten and remembered. So um, time is here in the red-green and what he says is that um, it doesn't matter what happens in real time. What happens is what is remembered and put into uh, memory storage. So there's a delay, and then you know, oh, it's green or it's red. In this case, it's green. And that's what you remember. And implying our remembered consciousness occurs epiphenomenally after the fact. We are literally living in the past. In real time, conscious experience is an illusion. Is there any hope for free will? We'll come back to the color five phenomenon. Now, Libet also did sensory experiments, which I think were much more interesting than his uh, finger-moving experiments. He had patients under uh, having neurosurgery while awake. Their brains were exposed. And uh, we still do this occasionally, but you, generally they're asleep now. But uh, he could talk to them, and he recorded and could stimulate the part of their brain for their, let's say, their finger here. He could also stimulate the finger. 
Now, if you stimulated the finger and recorded here uh, for 500 milliseconds, he got what's called an evoked potential uh, almost right away. This is well known. And ongoing uh, brain activity. If you stimulated here the brain, uh, and the conscious experience, if you stimulate the finger, occurs right away, immediately, almost immediately, uh, allowing for transition to the brain within uh, roughly 90 milliseconds. However, if you stimulate the brain directly um, and there's ongoing activity, you don't get the conscious experience for about 500 milliseconds, for about a half a second. And this is Libet's famous half a second, 500 milliseconds. So the point is that, that both... Now, what he then did was he, he tricked them and stimulated the thalamus and so forth, where he got an evoked potential, but then stop, there would be no further brain activity. So the point is that you need both the evoked potential and the ongoing activity out to 500 milliseconds to have conscious experience back here. So the brain or the person or someone must know somehow that this activity is going to continue for 500 milliseconds. Libby concluded that the subjective experience was referred backward in time, from the time of the neuronal adequacy, as he called it, back to the uh, uh, evoked potential. Consciousness is referred backward in time. Now, he published this and uh, was ridiculed by Dennett and Pat Churchill and many philosophers. This is obviously impossible. He must be crazy. And they kind of badgered him, and he kind of backed off and changed his tune. But I think he was right. I think that consciousness is, is referred can be referred backwards in time. Now, this sounds crazy, but it's known to, be, to, be, to occur at, at, at some times. So, for example, um, Wheeler and Feynman said that classical electromagnetics allow backward time referral, but requires quantum, a quantum system, a coherent absorber. Yakir Aharonov, uh, who works with Minas Kafatas, who is here, has described the dual vector theory. Each quantum state reduction sends quantum information both forward and backward in time. And Ben Schumacher and then Roger Penrose said that non-local quantum entanglement, which is a well-known phenomenon, requires, uh, involves referral of quantum information backwards in time. Now entanglement, this is the EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen uh, experiment, where you have two uh, uh, quantum particles that are paired, and they're in superposition of both up and down, spin, for example. And you send one along a, a, a wire to uh, Rajasthan, another along a, a wire to uh, Delhi. And you make the measurement in Rajasthan, and if it's down, then the, the, uh, the partner in, in Delhi is up. And if this one's up, this one's down. There's instantaneous communication uh, across many uh, great distance. I think the current uh, record is hundreds, hundreds of kilometers. The explanation that, that uh, Penrose and Schumacher and others put that when you make the measurement, the quantum information which is a strange bird, quantum information, goes backwards in time uh, to when they were together and then out, out the forward limb. And the communication, uh, signaling, you can't really call it communication, uh, involves backward time effects. There's evidence for this, too, backward time effects. Libet's, Libet's uh, backward time referral. Uh, Daryl Bam, Dick Berman, Dean Radin have all uh, done pre-sentiment experiments, or as Bam called it, feeling the future where, you, where uh, someone looks at a, a signal and seems to know in advance that it's what it's going to be. Uh, Zeilinger has shown choice of the measurement mode determines the wave particle behavior. And you can make the, uh, the choice of measurement after the, uh, the behavior has occurred. As long as it isn't observed in the meantime, you can have an effect backwards in time. And in neuroscience, uh, I've noticed uh, at, least, at least three labs that I'm aware of, uh, mainstream neuroscience labs, uh, doing uh, mainstream types of experiments, have found responses of neurons in the brain before the stimulus occurs. But they cover, they cover it up. They won't talk about it. And uh, it's embarrassing. And I've had one, someone say to me, well, if I talk, it'll ruin my career. Nobody will believe me. I'll say, you're sitting on one of the great discoveries of all time. You know, show a little courage. But so far, they haven't. But we're working on it. So how would this uh, uh, explain some of the problems about uh, epiphenomenalism? Well, if you have, uh, going back to the color phi effect, instead of uh, this happening afterwards, if you have backward referral, the observation uh, can be in real time. So the observer knows that it's going to be green or red because uh, the information is going backwards in time. Now, in libid uh, uh, readiness potential, the non-conscious choice could be informed by backward time referral of quantum information 
You, so you actually make the decision at this point uh, that you're going to move your finger, and it's sent backwards in time. And so it's consistent with the results. And I described all this in a, in a paper in Frontiers in Integrative Neuroscience last year, how quantum brain biology can rescue conscious free will. Because you need quantum effects in the brain to have this backward time effect. Now this would require some, some effect uh, on neuronal behavior other than uh, inputs, membrane potentials, and so forth. Some deviation from Hodgkin-Huxley behavior. And there's evidence for that. For example, in this pa uh, paper in Nature in 2006, um, this is the prediction from Hodgkin-Huxley. Uh, this is the uh, membrane potential in the dendrites and soma and the axon uh, spiking, which is kind of uh, gradual and, and fairly tight. So there's a very narrow threshold, as you would predict. But with the actual, if you look at neurons in an awake animal, uh, you see a very broad, uh, broad threshold, high variability in temporal, and that the, the threshold for firing in a given neuron fluctuates from spike to spike. So there's some other factor initiating uh, threshold and spiking other than simply membrane inputs. Also, the, the verticality of this was surprising, which seems to indicate that all the ion channels in the axon hillock uh, were opening simultaneously, that they might be uh, coherently coupled or entangled. So for example, uh, in integrated fire, the, the variability, in the temporal variability and the wide threshold could be caused by backward time referral and or some other effects from internal cytoskeleton or other, other neurons. One other uh, deviation from Hodgkin-Huxley that's kind of hushed up and covered up was published, was reported by Christoph Koch's group where they measured from the same uh, apical uh, uh, cortical neuron the, uh, at the, at the uh, uh, brain surface and in the, uh, in the cell body and they found that the membrane potential, the so-called noise, was perfectly correlated from, uh, uh, from the uh, microns away. And this can't be explained by membrane potentials and it can't really be explained by uh, electromagnetic effects. They didn't really have a good explanation for it. So this isopotentiality, that there can be this constant uh, uh, coherence among different parts of a neuron. So <clears throat> that was brain activity comes too late. The, another pop problem for mainstream approaches is quantum cognition. This is a very exciting uh, new area that we're going to hear about from Peter, Peter Bruza later in the week here, that mental activities fit quantum mathematics more closely than classical Bayesian mathematics. Now, what does that mean? Uh, for example, just descriptively, conflict, ambiguity, un uncertainty are best viewed as quantum superposition of multiple possible judgments and beliefs. Measurement, for example, answering a question. You're not really sure. Someone asks you a question. I better decide. You come up with an answer. Or reaching a decision. You just finally decide something. Reduces possibilities to definite states. You're constructing reality. You're collapsing the wave function. This is more of a quantum paradigm. Previous questions influence subsequent answers. So sequence affects outcomes. This is contextual non-commutativity, which is a, uh, a principle of quantum, quantum uh, mathematics and not classical mathematics. And judgments and choices may deviate from classical logic, suggesting random or non-computable quantum influences. Something else is influencing the choices. Now, Pados and Busmeier uh, have a paper, a target article in Behavioral and Brain Sciences called Can Quantum Probability Provide a New Direction for Cognitive Modeling? And in that paper, they, they show this, this graph where they, these are projections in abstract Hilbert space of mental of mental representations. So for t equals 25 milliseconds in gamma synchrony, e is about 10 to the 10th tubulins. And uh, uh, there's about 10 to the 9th tubulins per neuron, but not all the tubulins in a neuron would necessarily be involved. So this could be anywhere from, uh, we've estimated 20,000 to a million neurons for each conscious moment. In our recent paper, Roger and I are working on now, uh, he put forth the idea that, that I really like that the 40 hertz could be beat frequencies of slightly different, faster microtubule oscillations. For example, the megahertz os oscillations in microtubules that Anurban Banyapade has, has discovered, and uh, I think we'll, we'll talk about later in the week. So, and he'll also uh, tell us, I hope, about resonances in microtubules at different frequencies. And if you have resonances and beat frequencies, it's kind of musical, and it, it could be that consciousness is kind of the music of the universe, and that there's,
uh, resonances and beat frequencies occurring in the very fine structure of the universe itself. So this is a, a video. Hopefully it'll play. It's very short. Okay. Is there sound? The principal way brain cells communicate with each other is by exchanging chemicals. That's the large-scale view which all biologists understand. But in the neurons is a denser jungle of tiny structures called microtubules. Constantly flickering when you're conscious, they stop functioning under anesthetic. Hameroff concluded these microtubules must be an essential element in what creates consciousness. They create a secluded environment where quantum events could occur. He believes it's due to these quantum events that consciousness occurs at all. I always think it sounds better with a British accent. So um, with uh, Travis Craddock and, and Jack Jasinski, we've gone a little bit deeper into this more recently and also tried to adapt to the quantum cognition paradigm, which I think is going to be uh, a, real, uh, a real change. Uh, so uh, if you look at uh, what tubulin actually looks like, um, instead of these peanut-shaped cartoons, um, this is what it looks like. And this is, the work, this is a simulation done by Travis looking at the aromatic amino acids in tubulin. Uh, and why that's important, I'll, I'll come to in a second. But um, um, anesthetic gases, which is what my primary interest of study is, how anesthetics take away consciousness, they work only by quantum interactions and they bind in nonpolar hydrophobic regions, either in membrane proteins or, I think, in tubulin, by very weak uh, van der Waals London forces that are called dipole dispersion forces. So in this, in this uh, figure, uh, Travis uh, modeled the location of tryptophan in the blue, phenylalanine in, uh, in purple, uh, tyr tyrosine here, and these are uh, neurotransmitters, which we don't have. Uh, but just to show you how, uh, how structurally similar psychedelic drugs are and, uh, and neurotran psychoactive neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. They're pretty much the same structure. So if you look at where they are in a microtubule, uh, sorry, in a tubulin, in one tubulin, so this is one tubulin in a microtubule, um, they sort of line up in channels, and, we, and the red are where anesthetics bind. Travis uh, uh, simulated binding of anesthetics and they're right, they're very close to these aromatic amino acids. Now, what does this mean? Well, first of all, if, if you think about where, where does consciousness come in, uh, occur in the body, uh, it's the same question, I think, as where do anesthetics act? Because anesthesia is, uh, is fairly selective. Uh, I, I put a patient to sleep, and he or she continues to breathe. Uh, their brain is still active. We do evoke potentials where we're stimulating them, uh, for example, for spine surgery. We want, uh, we want uh, them to be able to process inf information from their stim we're stimulating the foot and recording in the brain to make sure their spine is, is, is okay, but yet they're unconscious. So the brain is processing signals even without, even without consciousness. So the, but anesthesia uh, selectively, so anesthesia selectively takes away consciousness while sparing non-conscious brain activities. And how does it do that? Well, it binds in a particular, it was shown at the turn of the 20th century that anesthetics bind in a particular lipid-like or olive oil-like environment. They, they, they bind in something that looks, resembles olive oil or benzene. And uh, this is also aromatic amino acids. So this diagram is a phase diagram, solubility di diagram of a body. It's as if you took a, a human and ground, ground them up and, and just looked at what their, their solubility compartments are. And going in this direction, this is polarity. So this is water soluble, for example, soluble in blood and water. Whereas you go this way, it's nonpolar. And so this would be fat and, and, and membranes and, and nonpolar regions within proteins, and including the aromatic rings, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, right here. Uh, and there's benzene right there. And this right here is where anesthesia, anesthetics act. And that's, all, that's the only place they go and they selectively e erase consciousness, which says to me that this is where consciousness is occurring, in this, in this phase here. Uh, now this is, but not in a ground up uh, a former person, but, but in, in a person in whom these things are still viable, namely in, in the aromatic rings here uh, that, that Travis showed. And they act by what are called London forces. 
So if you take, say, two benzenes, and uh, it, uh, depending on whether you use valence theory or uh, molecular orbital theory, in valence theory, they oscillate back and forth. In or molecular orbital theory, you have a, a superposition of both. So you have three extra electron bonds, and they can be distributed, or they can oscillate back and forth. Now, one of our critics said uh, uh, that our theory is impossible because the, the London forces would be like this. You can't have switching back and forth. And that's true if there was only one aromatic ring. But actually, there's, there's two or more. It takes two to tango, if you will. And when you have two or more London forces, uh, the, the dipoles, these quantum dipoles, oscillate back and forth, shown here in two different types of artistic re representation, and can be in superposition of both. So going back to, uh, to what uh, Travis showed, uh, we, uh, we think we see uh, channels along certain axes in the tubulin, which then line up with axes in a microtubule. And this is exactly, this is where the anesthetics bind. And we think that these are forming uh, giant dipoles, very much like Froelich described uh, in the 70s. Giant dipoles where uh, there's collective activity. Because here you have the aromatic rings, and uh, if, so here, they're all lined up going this way, uh, upward more or less, or rightward at least. In the blue, they're going downward. And in the gray, uh, they can be in superposition of both. Now, if you add an anesthetic, the anesthetic, which uh, by dipole dispersion forces, messes up the collective dipoles. You don't have these collective dipoles, and you don't have superposition. You have kind of haphazard arrangements of the dipoles. You've dispersed the dipoles. And that is how anesthesia works, I would say. It's, it's messing up, it's dispersing the dipoles that are required for consciousness, uh, both in, in these dipoles and in the superposition. Now, how does this relate? This is actually very similar to what's, uh, what's found in photosynthesis. When we first started this work uh, you know, 20 years ago, people said, you're crazy. Uh, everybody knows that quantum uh, coherence can't happen in biology, it's too warm. If you want to build a quantum computer, you have to go to the laboratory and do it at absolute zero because decoherence, any vibration, will mess up the, uh, will mess up the, the quantum coherence. And we said, well, it seems that you know, biology has had billions and billions of years to figure it out. Uh, it, it, it probably figured it out. In the last six or seven years, uh, quantum biology has been found in warm systems, in, in many systems, in bird brains, in, in smell and olfaction, in DNA and most notably in photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, um, in, in plants, and we're, we're on a farm basically here, and I think we're gonna go to the, the fields later in the week, uh, photons come in into part of the, uh, uh, the FMN, it's called the light harvesting complex, uh, FMO. And uh, to, to make food, it has to be, uh, uh, the, the energy has to be converted to electrons and taken to the reaction center. For, uh, to make glycogen or whatever it's going to make by electron transport. And you want this to be efficient because you, don't want, you want as much of the light energy to be converted to food. You don't want to waste it. And by the way, this is also uh, applicable to people making solar cells. They're studying this uh, very, very carefully. And what the Whaley-Fleming groups at UC Berkeley have figured out is that what happens is if, um, there are these uh, chromophores, which are basically kind of like uh, complexes of aromatic rings, just like I showed before, so they may have a metal with them, and that the electrons hop as electrons or excitons uh, and occupy all, all the pathways, all the possible pathways at the same time to get from here to here. That's why it's so efficient. That's why um, you know, food is, is relatively easy for plants to make because of this highly efficient electron transport, this exciton hopping. And we think the same thing can be happening in tubulin and microtubules. In other words, if a, if a tomato can figure out how to use electron hopping, I think our brains probably could too. But we'll find out. So putting it together, what I think is happening is, is something like this. And this is applying uh, what I just showed you to, um, to the quantum cognition ideas that I mentioned earlier. So here's a tubulin. And here are, I've just shown three aromatic rings. It's more complicated than that than I showed you. And here the dipoles are pointing upward. This is, and these correlate with the, the, three, the three starred helix around a microtubule. Microtubules have, uh, at least the A lattice, have Fibonacci uh, geometries where you have uh, um, uh, three star, sorry, this is the five starred helix going around, and this is the eight starred 
and uh, the dipole can be going uh, upwards or downwards. Now, I'm calling this happy because the microtubule and the tubule have a net dipole, positive and negative. Uh, positive, 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 negative, negative, negative. And if the dipole is in the opposite direction to the, to the, uh, to the dipole of the microtubule and the tubulin, it's going to be energetically favorable. It's going to be, to be easier to fall into. It's going to be happy, if you will. If it has to fight the dipole and uh, actually be uh, additional uh, dipole on top of it, it's going to be unhappy. So I'm just calling this happy and unhappy as a mental representation at the level of, of tubulins, but also relates to these uh, uh, pathways around the, the three start and over here the eight start helix. And this is in the, uh, a paper coming out in Topics in Cognitive Science in response to a, a lead article, uh, several lead articles about quantum cognition. So this is the molecular correlate of, of, molecular correlate of quantum cognition. And this would be the superposition of both the dipoles going in both states. So if you let these interact uh, and go back to our orc -OR model, there's a, they interact and there's a conscious moment and uh, the system has selected the yellow uh, sunny disposition happy uh, uh, because it's, it's energetically favorable and you have a, a conscious moment bing with, with happiness uh, associated with it. Now, you know, obviously I'm, I'm sort of uh, estimating here, but I think the, the energetic favorability and the fact that mental representations must occur somewhere and I don't think uh, it works very well at the neural level and so I would argue that this is the, uh, the origin of mental representation as, uh, as dipole states in, the, in a microtubule. Uh, similar was from uh, another paper in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. This is my commentary to uh, Pothos and Busmeier. And uh, I, when I first heard about this quantum cognition th stuff, I thought, you know, this is an interesting wrinkle. But the more I read about it and the more stuff keeps coming out, I think it's going to be more than a wrinkle. I think it's going to be a revolution in cognitive science and neuroscience. Now these, these pathways, uh, helical pathways, are, are, seem to be equivalent to what are called topological qubits or braids in topological quantum computing. Uh, and also to uh, what are called quantum walks in a Feynman quantum chessboard. Uh, Fuss and Navarro wrote a paper about uh, uh, cognitive uh, dipoles as, um, as, as quantum walks. And they had this diagram, where, which, is a Feynman, which is a Feynman path integral in a, in a lattice, which is called a, uh, a Feynman chessboard. And so you could take the blue or you could take the yellow and, uh, and have a superposition of both, and a collapse will occur and you'll pick one particular path. So it could be yellow happy or blue unhappy. Here's this, pretty much the same thing in a microtubule lattice. Uh, you can see it's a skewed hexagon. And I think the same thing could be happening in a microtubule lattice. So these topological uh, dipoles can be equivalent to uh, quantum walks or also to topological qubits. So you might say, okay, well, that's great. Well, how would that be read out? Because after all, you've got to move your hand or you've got to decide to do something. So how would the, how would the uh, microtubule activities be amplified even further? Um, well, microtubules could be uh, involved in integration inside dendrites and, and soma to modulate axonal firing. They can rearrange microtubule map scaffoldings in, in neuronal growth and synaptic plasticity, motor protein routing, memory, and consciousness. If you have a moment of consciousness, that's the readout right there. Aha, I thought of something. I feel something. It doesn't necessarily have to, ha have, to have some behavior, although it certainly could. Another possibility is that it's involved in some kind of fractal-like uh, brain processes. And, and I'm going to briefly go over this because uh, this has been talked about before, but uh, there's a lot of evidence for fractal uh, 1 over F uh, uh, scale invariant processes in the brain in EEG patterns, in fractal eye movements, in small world networks like airport hubs, spec speculation on holographic brain, in grid cells, in the entorhinal cortex, and so forth. All of these seem to have some kind of fractal-like uh, processes, and so these processes, the microtubules, might scale up uh, for behavioral processing in that way. And speaking of scaling up, um, uh, by equals h over t uh, here, depending on, on the, time, the frequency domain and the different, uh, the different uh, frequencies, uh, here's uh, Pokorny and, and Anurban Bandipati's uh, roughly uh, 10 megahertz or less, uh, also uh, Jack at 10 kilohertz, 
and uh, Freeman and Rakeley, it's, it's slower and so forth, and the speculation of higher, that this can happen at, at multiple uh, scales, and, uh, and that consciousness can occur at, as sort of a fractal at different uh, time and spatial domains in the brain, and when you get faster and small enough, you're actually you're in purely in space-time geometry, and you more or less don't need the brain anymore. And I always like this, the, the quote from the Beatles, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. So as you go uh, uh, faster and faster and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, more deeply into the universe, in the, into the fine-scale structure of the universe, involving uh, more and more, you have a more intense experience. And if we go back to the idea of space-time geometry, the consciousness is actually happening in space-time geometry, as you go deeper uh, at higher frequencies, you go deeper into the fine-scale structure of the universe and have more intense experience. And I think that, that meditative states and maybe even altered states and uh, things that, that are talked about in Eastern philosophy, uh, astral planes and so forth, might actually involve consciousness existing in space-time geometry without, without biology. So if we go back, uh, to wrap up, if we go back to uh, when did consciousness arise um, and look at the evolution. Uh, now, for cognitive consciousness, uh, I've suggested an article in, 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 uh, uh, 15 years ago or so that consciousness actually arose in these creatures at the Cambrian Evolutionary Explosion, which is what caused the accelerated evolution. Because an, an organism that has consciousness will have an advantage over those that, that don't in terms of survival and just in terms of survival. And if you, you look at this one, we know that it's actinospherium, and so, and they're made of microtubules, so perhaps the first cognitive consciousness that is organized, behaviorally oriented, uh, occurred in these types of organisms, and in similar, uh, because there's about 10, to, we know that there's about 10 to the ninth tubulins, and by equals H over T, uh, reduction could occur in a fairly brief period of time, like less than a minute. Uh, smaller organisms would take too long, and before that happens, they'd get eaten by something else. So I think uh, the onset of the Cambrian evolutionary explosion correlated with, with fairly rapid uh, conscious moments, and Bing may, may have happened uh, um, in these types of organisms initially. Finally, I want to close by saying that um, um, I showed you the Big Bang earlier, and uh, Vahid Gurdzian and Roger Penrose have a theory that we're going to hear about later in the week called cyclical conformal cosmology, that the Big Bang, uh, let's say here, was preceded by a Big Bang, which in the universe, preceded by another and another and another. And uh, if that's the case, then there's no reason to suspect that we didn't have consciousness in these previous universes, and that Bing and consciousness has been around for a long time, even before uh, the Big Bang and going back previous universes. Of course, it's, we don't know. But if there were previous universes, uh, perhaps uh, subsequent ones are evolving and mutating to get better and better for life and consciousness. That's a possibility. So let me conclude uh, with four points that first, consciousness or its precursors and or have been in the universe all along. Biology evolved orchestration mechanisms for cognitive consciousness. Two, consciousness is a self-organizing process in the fine structure of reality. You might think of it as the music of the universe, self-organizing processes in the, in the very fabric of reality. That consciousness independent of biology in the fine-scale structure of reality is plausible. Again, people who say, uh, you know, afterlife and out-of-body experiences and all this is impossible, when they, they can't explain conscious, normal consciousness in the brain. And until they do so, they can't rule out consciousness out of the brain. And finally, I think medical therapies for neurological and mental disorders should be aimed at microtubules. Thank you very much.